So in these videos, I have a habit of saying, but that's one for another time, because if I stopped to talk about everything in great detail, the videos would be, what, 30, 40 minutes long. But what usually happens is people can go, oh, that bit sounds interesting. Can you do more on that? Yes, I can. And that's why the Feast of Folk of War stuff got spread out to about three, four, five videos instead of being one very, very long one. And in that video, I talked about the 1982 Brazilian Grand Prix, when it was believed that the then head of FISA, Jean-Marie Balestri, had Nelson Piquet and Keke Rosberg disqualified from the race to promote Balestri's own countryman, Alain Prost, to first place and take the win. And then I mentioned another controversial disqualification that happened seven years later, again involving Alain Prost and that the seven years later thing would be a video for another day. So then, let's look at that incident and find out why it's still a very touchy subject 33 years later. Strap yourselves in, lads, because this one's going to become an absolute war in the comments section. So, the 1989 Formula 1 season. McLaren was still the team to beat, and while the MP4-5 wasn't anywhere near the OP-ness of the MP4-4 the previous year, it was still the car that was the yardstick for which the rest of the grid was measured. And while Mansell for Ferrari had won the first race at Jacarapagua, Senna had taken the next three race wins at San Marino, Monaco and Mexico. Prost took his first win of the season in Phoenix and would also win at Paul Ricard and Silverstone. Senna would win at Hockenheim, Prost at Monza, and Senna at Jerez, with McLaren wins being broken up by Thierry Boutsen at Montreal, Nigel Mansell at Hungary, and Gerhard Berger at Estoril. And tensions at McLaren had already begun to sour, or begun to sour. Yeah, we'll just go with what I've just said. Prost and Senna had entered a gentleman's agreement that whoever led the race into the first corner at Imola would stay there. Senna had beaten Prost off the line and led towards Toza and ended up leading the race over the first few laps. But on lap 4, Gerhard Berger's Ferrari flew off the track at high speed due to some mechanical issue, which is a eerie precursor to the same accident Senna would have five years later. But there is one difference between this accident and Senna's accident, and that is that Gerhard Berger's car burst into flames on impact, sort of how Grosjean's car did. Since this was at pretty much the start of the race, there was still a lot of fuel on board that only added to the problems. But the fire marshals got the fire out within 10 seconds and Berger was able to get out of the car with some second degree burns and some broken ribs. The race was restarted about an hour later but this time Prost got the better start and led Senna for the first little portion of the lap. But at Toza, Senna just dived his way past Prost and went on to win the race. Now Prost wasn't very happy about this because he still thought the gentleman's agreement was in place. But Senna thought, well that only applied to the first start not to any restart so all bets are off, fastest driver wins. But there is debate as to whether there was an agreement to start with, because Prost and the head of Marlborough at that time said that there was an agreement in place, but Senna said there was no agreement ever put forward, whereas other sources, such as the official F1 website, say that it was Senna that came up with the agreement. This discontent wasn't just limited to on-track, but off-track as well. Prost suspected that Senna was getting preferential treatment not just from Ron Dennis, but also from Honda. The head of Honda's R&D department at that time, Nobuhiko Kawamoto, had actually confirmed to Prost in a meeting that yes, the Honda engineers did enjoy Senna's more aggressive driving style, this being over Prost's more calculated race pace and Senna's one-lap magic pleased the Honda engineers as well. And Honda had also worked with Senna for longer, given that it was Honda turbos in Senna's Lotuses before he moved to McLaren for 1988. Honda promised equal footing, but this wasn't going to be the case. Both drivers had their own way of doing things. Senna wanted to go at warp 10 all the time, while Prost was more calculated, doing the bare minimum with which to extract the maximum. Senna was an engine man with Prost being a chassis man, by all accounts, and Senna would be able to psychologically bury Prost through just being absolutely mind-blowingly quick while, if any of what I've read is to be believed, using Prost's setups. Both had the desire to win and had their own ways of achieving it. It must have also been a bit of a blow to Prost as well, given that he'd been with the team for longer than Senna and had also won two championships already with the team. Prost and Lauder and guys like that were part of the reason McLaren had got through to the front and being the dominant force that they were in the late 80s, and now he must have felt that he was being kicked aside for Ron Dennis's new golden boy. Now, I'm not calling Senna that, by the way, I'm just trying to put myself in Alan's shoes. You, you really have to choose words carefully with this kind of stuff. 
But while Senna had won more races going towards Suzuka, Prost had been way more consistent. Alan had only failed to finish once at Canada, while Ayrton had retired in Phoenix, Port Ricard, Silverstone, Monza and Estoril, meaning that Prost had a lead going into the Japanese Grand Prix. It has to be said now, going into the final two rounds of that season, for Senna to win the title, he had to win both races. If he failed to finish either of them or didn't win, he would not be champion. He had to win. Ayrton had laid down one hell of a marker in qualifying. He was 1.7 seconds faster than his teammate in the same car, and 2 seconds faster than Gerhard Berger who qualified in third. But as the lights went out, Alan got the better start and led the Brazilian into Turn 1. But Prost was playing a very clever game. He knew that the McLaren was the class of the field. He knew, in effect, he'd just have to turn up and lay down some laps and he was basically guaranteed a front row start. He'd focus more on having his setup fine-tuned for the race, and just before the race started, he took off the gurney flap from the rear end of his car for some more straight-line speed, so he could defend from Ayrton into Turn 1 and into the chicane, which are Suzuka's only real overtaking points. So long as he had the lead into Turn 1, he had Senna in his pocket. And it worked to an extent. When Prost pitted for his first tyre change, he had six seconds on Senna. And when Senna came in and pitted for his tyres, Prost ended up being eight seconds in front. But this was going against the plan. Alan was too far ahead. With his tyres dropping off, Prost slowed up a bit to allow Senna to catch up. And even in 1989, cars were getting dirty air enough to affect the cornering ability of cars. And it meant that Senna's tyres would be getting knackered as fast as Prost's were. Prost was able to keep the gap at just over a second, which was getting Senna more and more irritated. Senna managed to find some pace on lap 45, managing to get a faster run through the spoon curve and get some slipstream as the cars crossed over the bridge and past the support race pit lane, and Senna was the closest he'd ever been as they headed towards the chicane, but he was still a fair bit back. But Senna being Senna, he dive-bombed it in from the next postcode anyway. Prost moved over to cover the inside line, and both of them had made quite the mistake. Now this is the part where you're expecting to see a picture of the two McLarens together at the chicane with Senna telling Prost he was going for first. But I wasn't going to pay £375 for it. But then again, if you're a Formula 1 or a racing fan, you've probably seen the footage and or a picture of it a hundred million times because it's one of those things that's made a highlight reel for eternity. But I will leave a link to the video in a pinned comment underneath this video if you haven't seen it because, well... It's also relevant to what comes later. So we know what happened next. Prost was out on the spot, but Senna managed to get himself going again and blew through the chicane to get back to the pits as his front wing had been lopped off in the impact. James Hunt called it self-inflicted, but to be honest, both of them were at fault. Prost had actually become tired of Senna's get out of the way or we both crash mentality. Senna, as described by Martin Brundle in that Top Gear segment on the three-time champion for his 50th birthday, had this way of driving that was, I'm putting the car here, it's up to you to decide if we make contact or not because I am not lifting. The other driver would move and Senna knew that every time that driver saw a bright yellow helmet in his mirrors, he'd get out of the way. And that's what Senna had tried to do at the chicane, and Prost wasn't having it. Prost moved in the braking zone to maybe make Senna chicken out of his own game, and they made contact. But remarkably, Senna managed to get round, get back to the pits, get a new nose cone, chase down Alessandro Nanini, and still win the race. But after the race, he was disqualified for reasons that have just become more and more confusing over the last 30 odd years. The rules were at that time that drivers were not allowed to receive outside assistance from the marshals to return to the track, but marshals were allowed to push the car to a safer place. The marshals do indeed push Senna back towards the track, which isn't exactly safe, so they then push him into the escape road of the chicane. It's here that Senna is able to bump start the car again and get going. Now by the rule book, that should have been the reason that Senna was disqualified. But he wasn't disqualified for that. He was disqualified for cutting the chicane. However, there's an onboard shot of Senna where you see him blow past a stop sign without stopping. There was one of these at the 1996 Belgian Grand Prix at the bus stop chicane when Damon Hill was given one of those in 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 no 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 stay out pit orders and had to wait for a gap in traffic and be told to go by a marshal with a stop sign. So this could have contributed to Senna's disqualification but who the hell knows anymore. There is also the fact that Prost was seen heading in the direction of the steward's office to complain to Balestri about it but the fact is 
old JMB wasn't even at the race. There would have been grounds to disqualify Senna for getting outside assistance that allowed him to get the car going again and continue the race. But the official reason was Senna had joined the track illegally, basically cut the chicane. So the stewards disqualified him for a totally different reason that over the last 30 something years has just fueled to the conspiracy theories and just caused mass confusion everywhere. So as it was, Prost won the title there and then at Suzuka. But disqualification or no disqualification, it didn't matter. At the following round in Australia, which took place in heavy rain, Prost withdrew after only one lap or so due to the conditions, and he was champion anyway, so it didn't really matter. Senna flew off into a commanding lead, but then crashed into the back of Martin Brundle on lap 12 while trying to lap him. So if Senna had kept his win, he would have lost the title anyway by retiring at Adelaide. It's still a collision that gets people talking, and the reasons given for the disqualification continue to confuse people even to this day. But it was only the beginning, as 12 months later, Suzuka would be the scene of one of the most explosive moments in Formula 1 history. So then, a look at the infamous 1989 collision between Alain Prost and Ed and Senna. If this has given you some new info, or just been new, or even just interesting, then you can like the video so that the algorithm can do its thing. And if you're not subscribed, do get subscribed and also get that bell on, so you never miss out on anything I do here. Massive thanks to the patrons over at Patreon, and if you want to help contribute to the image buying fund so I can buy some of these 375-odd pound images then you can help out by heading to the link in the description where there also be links to discord and also to my socials so until next time i've been aiden millward have a cracking day wherever you live in the world and i'll see you all again soon for another video goodbye